you don't tend to hear all that much about globalization anymore, do you? I mean, we hear about globalists. Stormy Daniels has absolutely sold out to the globalist. And getting the globalists out of the MAGA movement because there's so many globalists. But I'm not getting into that sort of anti-Semitic ants nest from Alex Jones and Jackson Hinkle with his weird fucking American sounding name. So it's like fucking clunks in your mouth, like marbles falling downstairs. Jackson Hinkle, ugh, horrible name. Maybe the reason that, that globalization isn't spoken about as much anymore is because it's viewed of as like a complete project. Or maybe it's that in the wake of the 2008 financial crash, there's been an uptick in interest in Marxism. And because of that, the left views of globalization tend to focus on imperialism instead of globalization, they use that word. But regardless, I have to teach a class on this soon, which has meant I've got to read a lot of literature on globalization in preparation, which I did not enjoy. And I've decided to make that your problem too. So there's, there's so much writing on globalization and so much of it is shite. It focuses on things like the shortening of global space due to things like telecommunication or international travel. Yeah, curiously, doesn't seem all that interested in questions like who makes all the mobile phones? How can people suddenly afford to buy relatively cheap commodities? Which people can suddenly afford to buy relatively cheap commodities? Why did globalization happen alongside deindustrialization of the global north. Are these things connected? Is there a direction to it? Why bother asking such questions? It's really, it's been frustrating. It's been a frustrating time. Globalization is a process, a set of processes, that embodies a transformation in which the spatial organization of the social relations and transactions, generating transcontinental or interregional flows of networks of activity, interaction and power. Okay, but what about production? Globalization is a social process in which the constraints of geography on social and cultural arrangements recede and in which people become increasingly aware that they are receding. Okay, but what drives this? What about production? Advances in technology, such as mobile phones, aeroplanes, telephones and the internet, have made the growth of transport and communication networks possible. Amongst other things, this means that people and countries can exchange information and goods more quickly. Okay, but what drives this? What drives the production of, of, of all these things? <laughs> Am I losing my mind? Globalization! Okay, no, that's too cringe. Okay, yeah. So not to get all vulgar Marxist on you, but... What if there is an economic base and a superstructure? What allows for the production of cheap telecommunications and global cultural exchange? Cheap labour. How do we source the natural resources required for the production of computers and for air travel? Cheap labour extracting resources from the global south. What facilitates the transformation in the spatial organisation of social relations and transactions generating transcontinental or interregional flows of and networks of activity, interaction and power? Production! and reproduction. And I don't even fully accept the base and superstructure metaphor, I try to disrupt it all the time. This is an aside for you Marxist nerds who might come at me. What have I become? But it's a sign of how empty so many of these definitions are that I have to crack out this simple metaphor to illustrate this simple point. Globalization comes from globe Hello. and means the worldwide coming together of countries and nations. What? So this video, which with its 3.7 million views, is probably the most viewed piece of media on globalization ever produced. I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you, 3.7 million views. We'll, we'll, I'm snapping at your, your heels. <laughs> this video actually does talk about production, but it does so in another way common to the globalization literature, which is deeply frustrating if you haven't been able to tell. It sanitizes production and implies that the exporting of production to the global south has a degree of parity for both sides. Poorer countries get jobs, whereas richer ones get cheaper products. The capitalist wealth generation trickles down. A rising tide lifts all boats. But the tide raises all ships, Mr. Castle. 
Companies which manufacture products under different conditions can now offer their products in country A too. It's also implied here that it's poorer countries own companies that are pushing the cheapening of commodities and the cheapening of labour, rather than say Apple, Nike or whatever, deliberately exporting their production to incorporated and often obliquely incorporated at like an arm's length uh, sweatshops. But you know, global coming together and or something. But the tide raises all ships, Mr. Castle. The actual relations of production are often left under-examined in this video and in much of the literature. And this is quite a common way in which people seem to talk about production as part of the globalisation without really actually critiquing the social relations of production. Rhoda Howard Hassman provides us with a really good example of this tendency. At first she seems to locate the nature of globalisation correctly in capitalist social relations. The chief impetus and beneficiary of globalisation is capitalism. Capitalist production is expanding throughout the world. As Michael Hard puts it, capital in some sense mediates all forms of production. Capitalism is the economic system behind new technologies of information and communication behind unprecedentedly large and quick capital flows, and behind the capacity of transnational corporations to spread all over the world. George Soros makes this point in his own definition of globalisation as the free movement of capital and the increasing domination of national economies by global financial markets and multinational corporations. In 1997, Jeffrey Sachs pointed out that, whereas 20 years earlier, only about 20% of the world's population had been living under capitalism, the rest living either under command socialism or in countries attempting to combine capitalism and socialism, by the time he wrote, the percentage had increased to 90. As societies hitherto outside the capitalist fold adopt a capitalist mode of production, many social changes occur. But this description reads to me like lampshading. It's like when in shows like Brooklyn Nine-Nine ostensibly criticise the police without actually criticising policing as such. Do you know what happens when you refuse to punish cops for their mistakes? It breeds a lack of trust in the community. Good. It makes them more scared of us than of criminals and gangs. You should be. It makes the people see us as the enemy. They are. You wonder how Peralta can do his job when he's held accountable for his actions? I wonder how any of us can do our job if he's not. Don't do your job. Simple. The thing about this clip and the thing I think with Brooklyn Nine-Nine is that even, even though there are bad police presented and even though the police force as it exists is being viewed of as institutionally bad, it doesn't criticise policing as such, in that you can still imagine a world in which a different institutionalised police service would be good. But there isn't, because policing as such is bad, and that's the trick that that pulls there. That's the trick that Brooklyn Nine-Nine pulls, it, even in its later series. In its earlier series it's just, what if some of the police were nice and fuck that shit? But these later series are even, maybe even more insidious. But this is just an aside for me not enjoying propaganda. We'll get back to globalisation now. And Howard Hassman's view is much like Brooklyn Nine-Nine in that she is locating an issue of capitalism but not criticising capitalism as such. Capitalism can be reformed in a way which is positive, according to the argument, which, as we all know, is horse shit. So I disagree with Howard Hassman. I don't think that the character of globalisation is a process of capitalism becoming the dominant mode of production in places that have been previously resistant to it. Rather, as offers like John Smith argue, is a process of changing and crucially intensifying the north-south exploitative relations. Because as people like Walter Rodney have shown, the exploitation of the Global South and the underdevelopment of Africa has been a feature of capitalism since its inception. And this is not a new thing. 
So it's not simply that capitalism is the economic system behind new technologies of information and communication, behind unprecedented large and quick capital flows, and behind the capacity of transnational corporations to spread all over the world. This is a truism. Because like, of course it is. It's, this, these things are happening now. Capitalism is the world system. So to say capitalism is behind these things doesn't really mean anything. Rather, what we should be paying attention to is that in exporting production to the global south, the imperial relations of production are changed. The costs of labor are drastically reduced as hundreds of millions of people are flung into the capitalist production process. They are forcefully dispossessed and fired into, into the fucking flames, the furnace of the production process as a new form of primitive accumulation takes hold. South-North export of manufactured goods as a whole must be thought of not so much as trade but as an expression of the globalization of production. And this, in turn, must be seen not as technical rearrangement of machinery and other inputs, but as an evolution of a social relation, namely, the relation of exploitation between capital and labor. International competition between firms to increase profits, market share, and shareholder value continues, but the fate of each worker is no longer tied to the fortunes of his or her employer. On the contrary, the employers that survive are those who most aggressively substitute their employees with cheaper foreign labor. South-North export of manufactured goods as a whole must be thought of not so much as trade, but as an expression of the globalization of production, and this, in turn, must be seen not as a technical rearrangement of machinery and other inputs, but as an evolution of a social relation, namely, the relation of exploitation between capital and labor. International competition between firms to increase profits, market share, and shareholder value continues, but the fate of each worker is no longer tied to the fortunes of his or her employer. On the contrary, the employers that survive are those who most aggressively substitute their own employees with cheaper foreign labor. This intensification of the relations of exploitation, not simply opening up of markets and trade, allows for the production of cheap commodities to be consumed disproportionately in the global north, thereby facilitating the uneven proliferation of communications technology, air travel and cultural exchange. That's why cultural imperialism, cultural exchange isn't one-sided. It's why American culture gets fired so forcefully across the world, why it's American companies that get fired so forcefully across the world. It's not an even exchange, it's an uneven exchange. It's not simply that corporations and finance have become dominant in the global co economy or that non-capitalist economies have become integrated into the capitalist economy, but that a period of bloody and violent dispossession has, uh, in, in those global south countries is, occur is occurring. And this is why NAFTA fucked over unionized Mexican labor and why going forward, whenever you hear the word cheap, what you should really hear is the word violent because cheap commodities Cheap labour is built on violence, direct violence. Globalisation does not eliminate inequalities in the distribution of wealth. However, it encourages investments into less developed areas of the world and allows poorest countries to find markets in richer ones. Walter Rodney spinning in his grave. Spinning. The concept of globalization and the potential benefits aren't hard to understand. By eliminating trade barriers in an honest manner, everyone could theoretically win. Try to join the rest of us in reality, Brito. So in presenting globalization in this deeply sanitized way, implying a necessary connection between the technological development and capitalism, and not discussing the rates of super exploitation necessary for the apparently desired process of growth, authors like Howard Hassman can say that she links globalization to capitalism without ever really criticizing capitalism and indeed supporting it. Supporting it for its supposed long-term wealth creation and raising of living standards. But remember Walter Rodney, capitalism, didn't raise the standards in Africa, but actively suppressed and underdeveloped it. And that is ongoing t today. And the fact it's ongoing today undermines another one of Howard Hassman's points that uh, in, the, in the longer term, capitalism might be 
um, might be better, but in the short and medium term, maybe it'll be maybe it'll be worse for those people. The longer term uh, impact of capitalism for the continent of Africa has not been improved conditions, has it? It's been continued forcible underdevelopment and a maintenance of colonial and then neo-colonial relations. So, uh, to that point, Howard Hasman, I say, no. And it's really weird, like several authors like Howard Hasman cite Wallerstein's world systems theory to argue that globalization by spreading markets has spread capitalist to non uh, to spread capitalism to non-capitalist or peripheral states. But this seems like a misunderstanding of world systems theory to me. Where's my rubber? Let me explain this. I need, I need, a, I need a whiteboard to explain this basic point. So Wallerstein's world system theory specifically views capitalism. Okay, so say we've got a world here. Okay, that's the world. It's the world. World. Okay, and Wallerstein's world system theory basically says that capitalism exists here in the world, across the world. That. Yeah. There are, there are core states, and there are peripheral states, and semi-peripheral states, but capitalism is still dependent on those, spa on those states. It's a world system. Hence why it's called a world system theory. This point, this is a nerdy point that really got to me. But anyway, I hope this diagram clears it up. World systems theory basically says that the privileged position of the global north in capitalism is sustained by the exploitation of the global south. Folk like Walter Rodney again have described the historic process of the Global North looting of the Global South to sustain world capitalism. Opening up markets in the Global South then isn't spreading capitalism across the world, but rather transforming the form of capitalist exploitation which already exists. And I think this is quite an essential point, because this has transformed the very reproduction of the essential commodity of capitalism, labour power. That is the commodity that a worker sells on the labour market to the capitalist. In the Global North, the cheaply produced means of survival, like food, like clothing, helped contain increases in the value of labour power in the Global North through the globalisation of super exploitation of the Global South. So the, 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 there's been an intensifying of capitalist social relations, not just in the Global South, but in the Global North as well to some degree. Neoliberal globalization has transformed the production of all commodities, including labor power, as more and more of manufactured consumer goods that reproduce labor power in imperialist countries are produced by super-exploited workers in low-wage nations. The globalization of production processes impacts workers in imperialist nations in two fundamental ways. Outsourcing enables capitalists to replace higher-paid domestic labor with low-wage southern labor, exposing workers in imperialist nations to direct competition with similarly skilled but much lower paid workers in southern nations, while falling prices of clothing, food, and other articles of mass consumption protects consumption levels from falling wages and magnifies the effect of wage increases. This is combined with a further globalized effect of migration, whereby the Global South worker travels to the Global North and it often takes on socially reproductive labor, further cheapening the social reproduction and cheapening labor power. And by the way, these are often um, disproportionately women who do this um, migrant, socially reproductive labor. And this shows how globalization isn't an expansion of capitalism per se, but a, an intensification of the super exploitation of the global south and a cheapening of global labor power. And globalization therefore is nothing more than imperialism. And it's also important to note that this migrant labour, which is gendered, is also racialized and further cheapened by the violence of borders. It's not a contradiction that at a time when the reliance on migrant labour has increased, that borders have become increasingly militarized. It's an effect of racial capitalism, which uses violence to reproduce race as a class relation and further capital accumulation. Keeping migrants precarious through carceral border regimes lessens their ability to organise for better conditions and keeps them disciplined to capital. So with all this in mind, you might think it might be quite difficult to argue that globalisation is a net positive thing, but let me introduce you to academics. <laughs>
As a feature of institutionalised globalisation, Howard Hassman's article is concerned with the realisation of human rights standards. It argues that to ensure that the rest of the world may someday be in the same fortunate position as the West, enjoying a relatively rights protected society, requires a level of institutional and bureaucratic change to ensure strong property laws, the regulation of private citizens' interests and the development of a middle class which can fight for its interests, producing democracy. This, she argues, is one of the benefits of globalisation and it is a position which is somewhat lacking in analysis of the globalised production process and the issues that we just spoke about. It is, can I say it? Dare I say it? Deeply neoliberal. not called something neoliberal in, in a while. Yeah, gotta love it. Howard Hassman actually argues that capitalism is a necessary precondition for democracy and therefore human rights. Capitalism is a necessary, though not sufficient prerequisite for democracy. Both quantitative and qualitative studies finding a correlation between capitalism and democracy also show that an intervening variable is necessary to affect such a correlation. That intervening variable is class action and organization. Not only is capitalism a necessary prerequisite for democracy, Freeman argues that it is also the only economic system, so far, found to be compatible with the relatively effective protection of human rights. Negative evidence to support the connections among capitalism, democracy, and human rights is the abysmal state of human rights in countries that still attempt to organize their economies on bases other than capitalism. Myanmar and North Korea come to mind, but so also does Cuba, which, without the support from Russia that it received from the Soviet Union, has been spiraling downward since 1990. Capitalism does not inevitably result in democracy, much less human rights, as some of the ideologically minded promoters of capitalism seem to believe. But without capitalism, democracy appears to be impossible, and without democracy, human rights cannot be protected. Far more than an economic system, capitalism relies on certain presumptions about the rule of law, and capitalism creates modern citizens, both bourgeois and worker, who in the medium to long term demand human rights. And this is a startling passage uh, and its inability to either make clear its assumptions or define what it means by democracy. Like, are we simply talking about an institutional arrangement of very limited political democracy? If so, should we simply foreclose any possibility of democratic management over the, the economic? And we have to assume that the answer to both these questions for Howard Hassman is yes. Different forms of democracy, such as that which exists in Cuba, are dismissed as false. Capitalism may produce some bad effects, but it's ultimately necessary, according to Howard Hassman. But the tide raises all ships, Mr. Castle. So while she doesn't say that uh, globalisation inevitably leads to improved conditions, she does argue that globalisation through capitalism, remember globalisation is imperialism, is imperial capitalism, is necessary as a necessary precondition to democracy, which is a precondition to the realization of human rights standards. But she does also concede the point that in the short and medium term, not sure how long that actually is, but in the short and medium term, uh, but in the short and medium term, the conditions produced by globalization might well be negative. But in the long term, there's there's no such certainty. The long term could very well produce the mass wealth and uh, improved conditions that we in the we in the global north all uh, all all have i'm not sure how if we have these things because of the exploitation not sure how but i guess this places are in a favorable position next to other champions of globalization such as steven pinker and bill gates who argue that the extension of markets and trends of globalization have been an under, undeniable good. This is a position that Jason Hickel, not to be confused with Jackson Hinkle. Is Jackson Hinkle Jason Hickel's Wario? Fuck, I cracked this wide open. Jason Hickel uh, shat on Bill Gates and Stephen Pinker's 
bullshit ideas. Uh, which I'll link it in the description. Good article to read. And the question then for Howard Hassman is how to temper the bad effects of globalization. And she has an answer. The International Human Rights Legal Institutions. Yeah. Fuck yeah, that'll do it. I'm fucking nailing it. <laughs> During the period of Western expansion, there was no international law prohibiting colonialism. Colonial conquest was a, quote, normal, end quote, practice inherited from the ancient world. It permitted stronger militaries and navies to take over territories previously not part of the world economy and permitted the colonists to curtail the economies of the conquered territories as they saw fit. So of course, we all know that now that there is an international human rights legal order, no colonialism exists in states like Israel. We know that there's certainly no neo-colonial relations between the Global South and Global North, facilitated by production, extraction and debt. There are laws against it. There are laws against colonialism. And surely no state would dare embark on military conquest in states like Iraq. That would be, that would be so against the law. That don't break the law. It's fucking you better not. Or else we'll condemn you so hard. You're gonna, be, you're gonna be shamed and condemned so hard. And there's several odd examples used in this paper, including international law being used to shame corporations into good practices. But the real point here is that the author doesn't consider that the international human rights order might actually be a product of the same social relations which produce the super exploitation of the global south. It may be of the same social relations that produce the bad effects that it supposedly solves in the first place. The international legal institution, including the international human rights legal institution, is hegemonic. They're part of that same global capitalist institution which facilitate the maintenance of, global, of the global system of super exploitation. A reading of Gramsci which highlights the profound connections between civil society and the economic is sorely missing here and from many liberal accounts of globalization and human rights. This means that when uh, Howard Hassman says things like, thus globalization speeds up the processes not only of capitalist expansion, but also of resistance to capitalism, she doesn't mean capitalism is producing the social conditions for mass movements to socialism, rather that the international legal order may temper the worst excesses of capitalism, um, may temper the worst excesses of exploitation while maintaining the conditions upon which that exploitation, that wealth building, that growth is built. But I'm not even particularly willing to accept her tempered position. International human rights has been used to justify war, imperialism and capitalist property rights. And indeed in this very article, the legal protections of capitalist property rights are framed as uh, good and essential. And beyond human rights, global governance and the institutionalized, bureaucratized changes which Howard Hassman views as uh, hemming in the worst excesses of capitalism have actually been essential uh, in fostering the indebted neo-colonial relations between the Global South and Global North. The structural adjustment programs pursued by the IMF and the laws set by the World Trade Organization are part of this system of global governance which facilitates this process. The neo-colonial process opens up those economies to extraction and super exploitation in one of the essential features of globalization. And the perspectives from folk like Howard Hasman, from liberal views of globalization, from these videos that have 3.7 million views and we're coming for them, we're coming for them, we're gonna get them, we're gonna, we're gonna catch up. <laughs> Um, the perspectives offered by these things can't fully grapple with the essential feature of globalization as an intensification of the super exploitation of the global south and a cheapening of global labor power. Because for this process to continue necessitates the constant human rights abuses of the production process, of the reproduction process, and of violent border politics. If globalization rests on capitalism, which is a prerequisite to democracy, which is a prerequisite to the international human rights and legal order, then perhaps instead of viewing globalization as neither good or bad, but inevitable, as liberal authors tend to do, we should instead view it as bad. Bad, it's a bad thing.
So many, many liberal views of globalization view it and position it as something which is inevitable, which is unstoppable, and like nature, neither inherently good or bad. This is an effect of long-standing liberal teleologies, or theories of historical progress, which view history as progressive. And again, they are somewhat, in this instance, in this formation, pretty neoliberal. <laughs> Howard Hasman again provides a really just fucking textbook example of this liberal teleology. The issue is not whether globalization is a thing out of control, eating up traditional societies, local values, and local economies. This is inevitable. Globalization cannot be stopped, and its forces will undermine what is left of purely local societies. The issue is the kinds of changes that globalization is likely to affect in the long as well as in the medium and short terms, and how societies and individuals will react to those changes. To argue whether globalization as a process is good or bad is as irrelevant as arguing whether the transition from an agrarian to an industrial society in the Western world from the 18th to the 20th century was good or bad. Many complex social changes occurred. Some economies were strengthened, some were weakened, which economies? Some states rose, some fell. Which states? Some social classes and categories benefited, others sank into oblivion. Which social classes? Globalization is not only inevitable, it is, despite all its costs, the only path to long-term growth. So I guess my first point regarding this quote is that I think it is actually relevant to argue about the relative merits of the Industrial Revolution. I think that's kind of an important thing to do. I think I don't I don't think it's pointless. <laughs> I, think, I think it's kind of important. <laughs> I don't I don't think either that or globalization, which remember is just capitalist imperialism. I don't think either of them are inevitable, and trying to begin off the assumption that they are is subscribing to a deeply troubling liberal teleology. And this passive voiced description seems to valorise globalisation as like a thing with its own agency beyond that of humanity, like almost like a god or, or nature. And this is again deeply neoliberal. <laughs> There's no reason why we should view this process as inevitable, and to do so seems absurdly dismissive of those struggling for liberation in the Global South. When the author says it's pointless to argue about whether or not globalisation is good or bad, we're being treated to one of the most privileged defences of capitalism that exists. What's important is to realise that globalisation itself is neither good nor bad. <laughs> it just depends how people deal with all the new possibilities in the future. Which people? Dealing with what? What possibilities? Why is it dealing with the possibilities in the future? Why is it not dealing with the fucking lived reality of the now? Why must you fail me so completely, Explanity? Why must you fail me? WHY MUST YOU FAIL ME SO OFTEN?! And in fact, Howard Hasman actually seems to position the fact that local bosses benefit from globalization and exploit local populations as evidence that those critical of globalization are misguided? Because if local bosses can be as exploitative as global corporations, then there's nothing inherently wrong with global corporatism. So the argument goes. Instead, we just need strong international standards and legal institutions. And this is one of several egregious examples from the author where capitalism as such is defended and the exploitation of those in the global south is just an unfortunate bug which can be removed. Globalization's opponents do tend to exaggerate its detrimental consequences. Ah oh, fuck, I'd forgotten how bad this quote is. The spread of capitalism results in uneven social change. Many millions of individuals benefit from new job opportunities, new markets and a new capacity for mobility whether from the village to the town, or from China to the United States. Giddens claims that between 1980 and 1994, the global labour force grew by some 630 million between 1980 and 1994. 
far outstripping population growth. The eventual outcome of globalization, even for the poorest society, is not necessarily negative, even in the short term. Social activists who oppose or try to stem globalization fight a rearguard action that if successful could deprive hundreds of millions of poor people of new and profitable economic opportunities. But these opportunities would not necessarily mean that these poor societies would become more rights protected. Yeah. So the obvious question to ask of this passage is who benefits and who doesn't? Are the children who are getting drawn into market relations in the factory producing cheap clothes benefit? The author assumes that being drawn into uh, capitalist employment relations over traditional social relations is a de facto positive thing that produces wealth even if it doesn't produce rights protection. Those who experience terrible conditions are actually being drawn into a process which may produce profitable economic opportunities and those who oppose this are just being short-sighted. Just being short-sighted. Sure, capitalism isn't perfect, but it's better than not capitalism. And this brings me to the final point I want to make here, which relates to a classic issue in human rights. Whether the human rights international legal system reflect cultural imperialism to go along with globalization's economic imperialism. And <laughs> despite its intent, the tone and content of Howard Hassman's article, and lots of liberal articles like this, uh, really supports the view that, yes, human rights are a form of cultural imperialism. First, we can return to the quotes from earlier that globalization and capitalism as such are apparently an inevitable process, which is neither good or bad, with neither good or bad normative character. It's simply inevitable. There's simply no point resisting cultural homogenization. This is a classic way of justifying colonialism and imperialism, and reeks of classic liberal justifications for both colonialism and slavery, really. Secondly, the teleological view uh, of progress employed by Howard Hassman places capitalism and Western social relations as inherently more civilized than traditional ones. Some people will be confused by these changes and long for a simpler time with a stricter normative order. Among them, some will and do fight viciously to retain the older world from which they are being so abruptly torn. This bizarrely forecloses any possibility that capitalist social relations are not a strict normative order. And I just wonder, like, what sense are the social relations of modern slavery not a strict normative order? Or the modern neoliberal gender relations? Or the necropolitical migrant uh, relations produced by globalization? How are these not normative orders? I don't, I don't follow how, how to make that argument, how to square that argument in a head. And Howard Hassman also taps into some deeply colonial re rhetoric when describing non-capitalist forms of life, which are subject to the civilizing social relations of globalized capitalist markets. As the new middle class becomes more aware of its own interests, it will become less willing to live under the rule of traditional elders, communist bureaucracies, or personalist dictators. To be clear here, the view that societies which have traditional elders are inherently backwards, uncivilized, and inferior to capitalist social relations is simply racist. Further, it fails to consider a very basic point made by Marx that political emancipation is often a fiction hiding the underlying forces of domination. Between equal rights, force decides. And the latter point here also applies to the attack on communist bureaucracies, an attack which doesn't seem to consider Western imperialism in harming those who live under communism through sanctions and war. In destroying the social relations of cultures with traditional elders or marketizing formula, formerly communist states, market relations simply create their own form of capitalist domination. Sure, we've destroyed alternative ways of life, but we've also imposed new forms of domination. What if there is an economic base and a superstructure? So the dismissive tone Howard Hasman uses when she argues that the charge of cultural imperialism is frequently heard and the politics of resentment is manipulated to hold back the tide of human rights 
comes across to me as both empty in analytic value and full of racist assumptions about non-West or non-capitalist global South cultures. This is just the classical liberal teleology of Smith and Locke. Globalisation is not an inevitable force. It's not civilising. It's bound up with super-exploitation, the destruction of cultural differences, and has produced global surplus populations subject to the conditions of social death. It's not inevitable. It can and should be resisted. So globalisation is not simply an inevitable, complex process where cultures and technologies shorten the distance between different states and peoples, but a process of intense capitalist imperialism which exports commodity production to the global south and cheapens the production of the essential commodity of labour power. It's a process which necessitates super-exploitation of the global south and which cannot be reformed via the liberal, uh, legal and human rights institutions which are part of the same social relations which produce exploitation in the first place. To fight against the horrendous conditions produced by globalised production chains and value chains requires full-on anti-imperialist revolutionary action not piecemeal legal codes, which frankly do absolutely nothing but assuage the guilt of liberals in the global north. So this was supposed to be a short wee video, but turned into a big old rant about globalisation, because I got annoyed, can you tell? Um, but in the end, it does matter that we figure out whether or not it's good or bad that globalisation's happening. And then it does matter that we fight it for ending climate change, among other things, ending exploitation, and building a better world. God, this video was, this was, this was the frustrating one. This was frustrating. This was very frustrating. So I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, liberals, man. Liberals. Can't live with them. Can live without them. Okay, we're done. We're done. We're done. I'm gonna go for a swim. Alright, uh, thanks to all my ten, uh, $10 and up patrons. Uh, Philip McKeehan, FD Signifier, Lizzie G, Quint Wolf, Kim Crawley, Dying of Thirst, Anita Anispe, Ellis Rin, Hey Joe, Quink, Tom Price, Esoteric Fictionalism, Shingo, Austin Talman, Robin, Rachel Mixon, Rich, Niels Avalgard, Tinfoil Pancakes, Kieran Gore, Aga Ghost, Daniel Hughes, Tamash Kispeter, and Paul Singleton. Thanks, uh, thanks to all those. Uh, Hello. Oh, what's that? No, yeah, I was recording oh. a thing for John the Duncan. Sounds like. No, sounds director, like thought slime. They don't forgot to turn off their microphone. Yeah, and... I think I can. I can easily find the the weak links and, oh. and kind of break them. Okay. Mm hmm. Hail imperialism. Okay, bye. Oh shit, I left the microphone on!